The British Army during the American War of Independence served for eight years in campaigns fought around the globe. Defeat of the Siege of Yorktown to a combined Franco-U.S. force ultimately led to the loss of the 13 colonies in eastern North America, and the concluding Treaty of Paris deprived Britain of many of the gains achieved in the Seven Years' War. However several victories elsewhere meant that much of the British Empire remained intact. In 1775 the British Army was a volunteer force that numbered just over 45,000 men thinly spread out in various locations globally. The army had suffered from lack of peacetime spending and ineffective recruitment in the decades since the Seven Years' War, circumstances which had left it in a dilapidated state at the outbreak of war in North America. To offset this, the British government quickly hired contingents of German mercenaries to serve as auxiliaries alongside the regular army units in campaigns from 1776. Limited army impressment was also introduced in England and Scotland to bolster recruitment in 1778. However the practice proved too unpopular and was prescribed again in 1780. The attrition of constant fighting, the inability of the Royal Navy to decisively defeat the French Navy, and the withdrawal of the majority of British forces from North America in 1778 ultimately led to the British Army's defeat. The surrender of Cornwallis's army at Yorktown allowed the Whig opposition to gain a majority in Parliament, and British operations were brought to an end. Structure and Recruitment Britain had incurred a large national debt fighting the Seven Years' War, during which the army's establishment strength had been increased to an unprecedented size. With the ascension of peace in 1763 the army was dramatically reduced to a peacetime home establishment of just over 11,000 men, with a further 10,000 for the Irish establishment and 10,000 for the colonies. This meant 20 regiments of infantry totaling just over 11,000 men were stationed in England, 21 regiments were stationed in Ireland, 18 regiments were stationed in the Americas, and 7 regiments stationed in Gibraltar. Alongside this the army could call on 16 regiments of the cavalry, a total of 6,869 men and 2,712 men in the artillery. This gave a theoretical strength of just over 45,000 men exclusive of the artillery. The British government deemed this troop strength to be inadequate to prosecute an insurrection in the Americas, as well as deal with defense of the rest of its territories, so treaties with German states were negotiated for a further 18,000 men. This measure brought the army's total establishment strength to around 55,000 men. After the losses at the battles of Saratoga and the outbreak of hostilities with France and Spain, the existing voluntary enlistment measures were judged to be insufficient. Between 1775 and 1781, the regular army increased from 48,000 to 121,000. In 1778 the army adopted some non-traditional recruiting measures to further augment its strength. A system of private subscription was established, whereby some 12 new regiments totaling 15,000 men were raised by individual towns and nobles. In the same year the government passed the first of two recruiting acts which allowed a limited form of impressment in parts of England and Scotland, under strict conditions. However, the measure proved unpopular and both acts were repealed in May 1780, permanently discontinuing impressment in the army. The recruiting acts of 1778 and 1779 also provided greater incentives for voluntarily joining the regular army including a bounty of £3 and the entitlement to discharge after three years unless the nation remained at war. Thousands of volunteer militia battalions were raised for home defence in Ireland and England, and some of the most competent of these were embodied to the regular army. The British government took a further step by releasing criminals and debtors from prison on the condition they joined the army. 
Three entire regiments were raised from this early release program. In November 1778 the establishment was set at 121,000 men, of whom 24,000 were foreigners, along with 40,000 embodied militia. This was raised the next year to 104,000 men on the British establishment, 23,000 on the Irish establishment, 25,000 foreigners and 42,000 embodied militia, for a total force of about 194,000 men. Although a large portion of the rank and file were lower class and the officers upper class, the army recruited from a variety of social backgrounds, both among the regular and officer ranks. According to Reed, the Georgian army through necessity drew its officers from a far wider base than its later Victorian counterpart and was much more open to promotion. From the ranks, officers were required to be literate, but there was no formal requirement on the level of education or their social standing, and most regimental officers did not come from the landed gentry, but from middle-class private individuals in search of a career. Although the system of sale of commissions officially governed the selection and promotion of officers, in practice the system was considerably relaxed during wartime, with far more stringent requirements placed on promotion. Leadership The Commander-in-Chief India formerly held command over Crown forces in the East Indies, and the Commander-in-Chief North America commanded Crown forces in the Americas. Nevertheless there was no real overall command structure over the British Army in 1775 which meant that British generals often worked on their own initiative at various points during the war. The position of commander-in-chief of the forces remained vacant until 1778 when it was given to Geoffrey Amherst, first Baron Amherst who held it until the end of the war. However his role in advising the government on strategy was limited and Amherst found himself primarily occupied with the organization of home forces to oppose the threatened invasion in 1779, and suppress the outbreak of severe anti-Catholic rioting in 1780. The direction of the British war effort ultimately fell to the Secretary of State for the Colonies, George German, 1st Viscount Sackville. Despite not holding a formal position in the army, he promoted or relieved generals, took care of provisions and supplies indirected much of the strategic planning. While some historians argue Sackville carried out his role effectively, even brilliantly, others have argued he made several miscalculations and struggled to hold genuine authority over his subordinates in the army. Infantry Infantry formed the backbone of Crown forces till the end of the war. The elite of the infantry were formed in the Foot Guard and the Highland regiments, who were usually the tallest and fittest men. On taking command in America General William Howe gave orders that every regiment form a company of light infantry who were then placed in composite light infantry battalions. These men were again hand-picked from the tallest and fittest of the rank and file. Tactics During the French and Indian War the British Army had adopted new infantry tactics to better suit campaigning in North America. In battle the Redcoats usually formed in two lines rather three to increase mobility and firepower. The British Army further adapted this formation during the American Revolution by forming and fighting in looser ranks a tactic that was known as loose files and American scramble. Soldiers stood at a greater distance apart and three orders were used to specify the distance to be expanded or contracted as necessary, order, open order, and extended order. British infantry advanced to the trot and fought fluid battles primarily utilizing the bayonet. Although this new formation increased the British Army's mobility and tactical flexibility, the abandonment of linear formation was later blamed by some British officers for defeats in the later stages of the war like the Battle of Cowpens, in which British troops engaged denser bodies of men deployed in successive lines. The most common order of battle positioned the light infantry and grenadiers on the flanks of the main line of infantry. 
While Highlanders or guards were usually held back as a reserve, the most proficient line regiments were deployed on the right, while inexperienced regiments or militias were placed on the left of the battle line. The German mercenary regiments that joined Howe's army in 1776 likewise adopted the two-rank formation used by the British army. However unlike the British they retained the traditional close order system of fighting throughout the war. At the Battle of Vigy Point in 1778 a force of British infantry who were veterans of colonial fighting inflicted heavy casualties on a far larger force of regular French troops who advanced in columns. Clayton describes how dot, the use of light infantry, well led by their officers and NCOs, was of key importance in advance as skirmishes fired on French columns from behind cover when the French attempted to extend they were threatened with bayonet charge, and when the French advanced they fell back to prepare for further skirmishing and ambushes from all directions. Fortescue similarly describes the action, advancing in skirmish order and keeping themselves always under cover. The light companies maintained at close range the most destructive fire on the heavy French columns. At last one of the enemy's battalions fairly gave way and the light companies followed them to completed the route with the bayonet. Riflemen and light infantry The British Army had no dedicated corps of light infantry. Instead in times of war it employed companies of light foot seconded from line troops. In 1758 General Thomas Gage formed an experimental light infantry regiment known as 80th Regiment of Light Armed Foot. This is considered to be the first regular light infantry regiment to serve in the British Army. On becoming commander-in-chief in North America in 1758, General Geoffrey Amherst ordered every regiment to form light infantry companies from their ranks, a system which continued until the early 19th century. Soldiers of the new light infantry not only adopted new tactics but adapted their uniforms. Coats were cut short, so that they rested at the men's waists. All lace was removed and the cumbersome tricorn hats were cut down to brims to resemble derby hats, while some were issued with short leather caps. The lighter armament consisted of a shorter musket, while the heavy and cumbersome cartridge box was replaced by a small one, instead worn across the stomach, containing nine cartridges lined up in a row for easy access. Light companies were also issued with powder horns and naval boarding axes. In 1771-72 the British Army began implementing a new training scheme for light infantry companies. Much of the early training was found to be inadequate, with officers unsure how to use light companies. Many of the brightest young officers sought commissions elsewhere because being light bob officer lacked social prestige. In 1772 General George Townshend wrote instructions and training and equipping of the new light companies which was issued to regiments on the Irish establishment and offered a practical guide for training light companies and guidance for tactics such skirmishing in broken terrain when acting independently, in sections or in large groups. Townshend also introduced a new communication method for light bob officers when in command of loosely deployed, scattered troops. Whistle signals would indicate movements such as advance, retire, extend or contract. In 1774 William Howe wrote the manual for light infantry drill and formed an experimental light infantry battalion trained at Salisbury Camp. This became the pattern for all regular light infantry serving in North America. Howe's system differed in that it focused on development composite battalions of light infantry more suited to large-scale campaigning in North America, rather than individual companies. Although some light infantry were issued with rifles, the British Army did not have a dedicated corps of riflemen and usually relied on Jaegers. Major Patrick Ferguson formed a small experimental company of riflemen using regular British troops which fought in campaigns from 1777 to 78. 
This company was armed with the experimental Ferguson rifle. Loyalists see also Loyalists fighting in the American Revolution. Large numbers of scouts and skirmishes were also formed from Loyalists and Native Americans. The renowned Robert Rogers formed the Queen's Rangers, while his brother James Rogers led the King's Rangers. Loyalist pioneer John Butler raised the provincial regiment known as Butler's Rangers who were heavily engaged in the northern colonies during which they were accused of participating in massacres at Wyoming and Cherry Valley. The majority of Native Americans favored the British cause and Mohawk leader Joseph Brandt commanded Iroquois and Loyalists in campaigns on the New York frontier. Colonel Thomas Brown led another group of King's Rangers in the southern colonies, defending East Florida from invasion, raiding the southern frontier and participating in the conquest of the southern colonies. Colonial Governor John Murray, 4th Earl of Dunmore raised a regiment composed entirely of freed slaves known as the Ethiopian Regiment, which served through the early skirmishes of the war. The Loyalist units were vital to the British primarily for their knowledge of local terrain. One of the most successful of these units was formed by an escaped slave and veteran of the Ethiopian Regiment known as Colonel Ty, who led the so-called Black Brigade in numerous raids in New York and New Jersey, interrupting supply lines, capturing rebel officers, and killing suspected leaders. He died from wounds in 1780. Uniform and equipment The standard uniform of the British Army consisted of the traditional red coat along with tricorn hats, white breeches and black gaiters with leather kneecaps. Hair was usually cut short or fixed in plaits at the top of the head. As the war progressed many line regiments replaced their tricorners with slouch hats. The full marching order, a line infantryman was expected to carry on campaign was extensive, and British soldiers often dropped much of their equipment before battle. Light foot were issued with short coats, with their ammunition box worn across the front of their stomach rather than at the side as by line infantry. Grenadiers usually carried cavalry sabers as a sidearm, while light infantry carried small axes. Soldiers were also issued with great coats to be worn in adverse conditions, and were often used as tents or blankets. Drummers usually wore colors in reverse of their regimental color, they carried the coat of arms of their colonel and wore mitre caps. Most German regiments wore dark blue coats while cavalry and loyalists often wore green. The most common infantry weapon was the brown best used alongside a bayonet. However some of the light companies were issued with the short barrel muskets or the Patton 1776 rifle. The British Army also conducted limited experimental use of the breech-loading Ferguson rifle, which proved too difficult to mass-produce to be used more extensively. Colors British infantry regiments possessed two flags, the King's color and their regimental color, which displayed color of the regiment's facings. In 18th and 19th century warfare, the colors often became a rallying point in the most bitter actions. Both regimental standards were highly regarded and a source of pride each regiment. However, because of the tactical constraints in conducting the war and the adapted mode of fighting, it is likely that British regiments only used their colors for ceremonial purposes in America, particularly the armies commanded by Howe and Cornwallis. However, in the early years of the war, the Hessians continued to carry their colors on campaign. Major General Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Losberg wrote, They, the British, have their colors with them only when courted, while we carry them with us wherever the regiments go. The country is bad for fighting. Nothing worries me more than the colors, for the regiments cannot stay together in an attack because of the many walls, swamps, and stone cliffs. The English cannot lose their colors, for they do not carry them with them. During the Saratoga campaign, Baroness Riedersel, the wife of a German officer, saved the colors of the Brunswick regiments by burning the staffs and hiding the flags in her mattress. Daily life The harsh conditions of life in the army meant that discipline was severe. Crimes such as theft or desertion could result in hanging and punishments such as lashings were administered publicly. 
Soldiers spent a great deal of time cleaning and preparing their clothing and equipment. Families were permitted to join soldiers in the field. Wives often washed, cooked, mended uniforms and served as nurses in the time of battle or sickness. The army often suffered from poor discipline away from the battlefield. Gambling and heavy drinking were common among all ranks. The distance between the colonies and the British Isles meant logistics were stretched to breaking point with the army often running out of food and supplies in the field, and forced to live off the land. Training training was rigorous, firing, bayonet drills, movements, physical exercise, marching and forming were all part of the daily regimen to prepare for campaigns. During the course of the war the British army conducted large-scale mock battles at Warley and Coxheath camps in southern England. The primary motivation behind this was in preparation for the threatened invasion. By all accounts, the camps were massive in scale involving upwards of 18,000 men. One militia officer wrote to his friend in August 1778. We have frequently marched out in considerable bodies to the heaths or commons adjacent, escorted by the artillery, where we go through various movements, maneuvers and firings of a field of battle. In these expeditions, let me assure you, there is much fatigue, and no little danger. The most grand and beautiful imitations of action are daily presented to us, and believe me, the army in general are becoming greatly enamoured by war. The manoeuvres carried out at Waller Camp were subject of a painting by Philip James de Lauterburg known as Warley Camp, the Mock Attack, 1779. He also drew detailed illustrations of the uniforms of the light infantry and grenadiers present at the camp which are considered some of the most accurate surviving illustrations of 18th-century British soldiers.